here today have something that you love doing, something that gets you excited, makes you happy, that brings you joy. Say I. So we all have something like this, and for me that's always been books. Since I was about this big, my mom tells a story about how I would run home after school, open the door and just beeline straight to the bookcase, grab a book, and then I'd be good for hours. They didn't need to worry about me. Those books, they didn't just serve as an escape from my reality. They gave me a window to the world. They showed me things about life. And that love of books has continued to this day. You know, I love holding a book in my hand. I have my Kindle and all that kind of stuff, but I love just holding a book. My wife and my friends make fun of me on a regular basis where every single time we move, my boxes of books have to go with me. They're like little treasures. I just can't get rid of them. It doesn't matter how long ago I've read them, how tattered up they are. And today, I'm here to talk to you about one of those books, a classic book. A book by now I must have read over a hundred times. This book has made me think about some of the most basic elements of human struggle. They made me rethink the templates that we use to explain life's most basic principles and concepts. The book I'm talking about is obviously The Very Hungry Caterpillar. <laughs> I see you've read the book. Uh, some of you might have been expecting me to pull out something like The Old Man in the Sea, War and Peace, Atlas Shrugged, and those are great, amazing books, but I have two little kids. So my reading materials over the last few years have whittled down a little bit, and The Very Hungry Caterpillar is a good one. My kids love this book. They've read it by now in English, in Spanish, in Hebrew. They just can't get enough of it, and why wouldn't they love it? It's a book about bugs, and let's be honest, kids love bugs. And it's this nice little metaphor of their life. The little guy is born, and he eats, and grows up, and gets bigger, and eats more, you know, apples, and pears, and all that stuff. You've read the story. Now, as somebody who studies human nature, and particularly addiction and compulsive behaviors, I've got to say, on the sixth day, I think the guy was struggling with a little compulsive binge eating or something. I mean, for crying out loud, cake, ice cream, sausage and pepperoni, cheese, candy, pickles. I mean, for all we know, this here is literally the caterpillar's college stage. <laughs> but that's not even the most important part. It's not the one I want to focus on today. And the reason is that something magical happens on the next page. After all the feeding is done, when the caterpillar is as big as it's going to get, it wraps itself up in a beautiful cocoon, and then it goes to sleep. And on the very next page, it emerges as a beautiful butterfly. It's such a classic tale of transformation. Magical, quick, and unfortunately for most of us, completely divorced from reality. I know because I've gone through my own version of a metamorphosis of sorts. And through my work, I've seen hundreds of people literally transformed. For me, it started pretty simply, with a nice upper middle class um, childhood, growing up, playing outside, hanging out with friends, going to school, just the usual. And then, my family decided to move all the other way to the other side of the world, to America. I was really excited about it, I mean, wouldn't be excited about moving to America, but once it happened, I found myself isolated, not very well prepared. I spoke the language, but not that very well. I had a strange accent at the time, which didn't make it easy, especially because I missed my friends and I had a hard time making new friends. I was 14, it was the beginning of high school, not exactly the easiest time to make friends anyway. In some ways, I consider the next few years of my life as my first active attempt at transforming who I was into my new American self. So I did what anybody would do. I joined a football team, I listened to a lot of pop music, and I practiced my accent. Not bad, right? It took a while, but it worked, and life got smoother. I ended up having friends. I drove a car. It was a Buick Regal, but it was a car. I got a girlfriend. My life seemed perfect. And then we went away to college, and she broke up with me, and it felt like my life pretty much completely collapsed. Anybody remember New Love? the beginnings. So I was in college going through that and I found solace in what all my friends found solace in, which was alcohol and weed. A lot of alcohol and a lot of weed, to be honest. <laughs> that wasn't that different from all my friends, 
but I went even harder, as I like to do. So I found harder drugs. I found cocaine, I found hallucinogens, MDMA, methamphetamine. I did whatever I could in order to push away, to numb, to ignore the pain, the depression, the sadness that was enveloping me. In my own version of the Caterpillar's Saturday Night Binge, I made drugs the center of my universe. I started selling them, surrounded myself with more and more people who were equally as lost as I was. I made a lot of money, used even more drugs, and dug myself deeper and deeper into a hole. And then one day, somebody held me up at gunpoint, and I went out and bought my own gun. My transformation had been complete. Get up, hands over your head, hands in the air, get up. I gotta tell you, there's no better way to wake up in the morning than have a SWAT team run into your bedroom at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning. Filling your room with cops who are just pointing automatic weapons straight at your head as you lay in bed. I was facing 18 years in prison for 13 felony counts, and my life seemed pretty much over at the ripe old age of 25. Did you know that during the process of metamorphosis, a, but, a caterpillar doesn't become a butterfly simply by adding on some beautiful wings and the removal of some legs? I mean, it seems like that process should be easy enough, right? That's why we love using it as a metaphor for change. However, what actually happens behind closed doors, or you know, closed chrysalis, is way more dramatic than we give it credit for being. That caterpillar, has to use the same digestive juices it used to eat all that food before to literally break down its own body. The resultant cells that can pretty much be described as primordial soup at that point, or goo if you open it up, are like human stem cells that then create a butterfly essentially from scratch. You see, on my next page, after the SWAT team arrest, there was no butterfly. Actually, as I was working on this and thinking about my life, I couldn't even figure out exactly where the butterfly would come in. I mean, would it be when, uh, maybe it was when I quit drugs. If not then, then maybe when I got into graduate school or maybe when I graduated. No, not quite yet. Maybe when I met my wife or got married. When I had my kids. Maybe the butterfly hasn't even shown up at all yet and it'll show up when I get off this darn red circle, or when I finally finish writing that book I've been meaning to work on for the last 10 years. All of this hit home as I was being interviewed for a documentary on addiction. And the filmmaker asked me a pretty simple question. She just asked, how did you know back then, after everything that you had been through, that you were going to be okay? I started tearing as soon as she asked the question. The reality was, I had no idea that I was going to be okay. Nobody did. I mean, pretty much everybody who knew me back then would have been completely surprised and happy if I could have just found a way to move forward through life staying out of prison. The only thing I could figure out at the time was how to wake up every morning and put one foot in front of the other, deliberately walking forward. Trust me when I tell you that nobody imagined that 15 years later I'd be standing in a circle like this talking to a crowd like you. Back then, I was just trying to get a job. And then I would get rejected time and time and time again. Every single time I saw a job application and had to check that box. You know that box, the one that asks you if you've ever been convicted of a felony? Many of you may not have had to think much about that box before. But for me, that box became the seal of death. It was the nail in the coffin, the guarantee that I'm never going to hear back from these people. And so it went for months. It was only after dozens of these kinds of job applications and no help that I finally applied to go back to school. The place I swore, by the way, I would never go back to. But I was out of options. Couldn't get a job anywhere, had no idea how to move forward past this life that I'd made for myself. Trust me when I tell you that nothing was safe and nothing was certain. Over the past 15 years, I've had to 
recreate or eat the previous version of myself many times, for me, probably like you, the process of change is ongoing. I don't think it's anywhere near over yet. Sure, everybody loves the story of the ex-drug addict who's made a life for himself. It's nice and it's easy to ignore all the pain, the struggle, the effort that went into it when the end result seems relatively natural as you see me now. It's even easier to ignore the stuff you literally don't see behind me. All the support, the help I needed from my parents, my friends, my mentors, people without whom, trust me when I tell you, there's no way I'd be here. But everybody wants a simple story. The problem with that is that this myth we've created, that real magical transformation happens only to a select few who are either incredibly successful and good or incredibly lucky, means that the struggles that all of us end up going through get interpreted by so many as failures when they're anything but. However, even in that story of the very hungry caterpillar, contrary to the one page magical transformation the caterpillar goes through, a real caterpillar takes two weeks or more to transform itself into a butterfly. Now, I took the liberty of doing a little bit of calculation for you guys and translating that into human years. It ends up being about seven to 40 years of work. I know that's a big range, but how many people think that sounds a little bit more realistic? You see, these magical transformation or happily ever after stories, as I call them, that we tell, the ones that promise that real happiness is waiting for all of us just past some magical rainbow, they don't serve us well. I learned a lot about my life and what to expect from the books that I read. I'm sure that you guys did too. And guess what? If we teach kids that life is full of magic and happiness and free of struggle and that you just meet somebody and magically live happily ever after, what do they learn to expect? Exactly that. So many of the clients that I've dealt with in my life over the past 10, 12 years have struggled with exactly this problem. They expected life to be smooth and full of beauty and success, only to be confronted with reality. Sometimes it's simple stuff. Maybe they just didn't do as well in school as they thought that they would or were promised that they would. Maybe they didn't end up being as popular as they wanted to be. But sometimes it's serious. Like maybe they struggle with trauma early on that nobody would ever talk about and kind of got brushed under the surface. Or maybe they suffered a health setback that came out of nowhere. The bottom line is they weren't prepared. And when their real life didn't match their fantasy, they felt like failures. So, just like me, they turned to coping strategies. Strategies that made it easy to move away from the pain, numb it, ignore it in the short term, but created even more pain and suffering in the long term. The most magical transformations that I've seen in these people happen when they realize that their strife, their struggles, they're not impossible to overcome. They're not some magical indicator that they're faulty at heart. All they're an indication of is that they're human and they're struggling with everyday life. Resilience is the ability to positively and effectively adjust to adversity in life. If we want our kids to be resilient the same way we want them to be good at math or at reading, we have to train them to do so. And this isn't rocket science. I know there are a lot of rocket scientists here. Um, but this isn't rocket science. We know many of the factors that end up being important. This is not an exhaustive list. But look at some of the things that matter. Social support, self-esteem, having an appropriate cognitive perception and appraisal of what it is you're struggling with, having a sense of control of your world. Think of all the things that happen, especially in these uh, second, third, and fourth points, when you've been told your whole life that relationships are supposed to be easy. Life is supposed to be smooth, and then it doesn't end up being that way. What about the social support of the shame, the fear you have that you're a failure and that you withdraw? You look for other ways to deal with the pain, and you don't turn it to other people because their life is perfect. Let's test this here right now. How many people got to be an adult? Those of you who are adults. How many people got to be an adult up to this point in life with zero struggle? Anyone say I. Anybody become part of a relationship? 
that was completely free of tension or fights? Oh, you laugh. Okay. Let's test, let's test it the other way around. How many people had to work really, really hard to get to whatever point it is you're in life right now? Say aye. How many people are part of relationships that are amazing but require ongoing work and effort to maintain them? You see, human struggle, it's not a problem somebody's going to solve one day. It's a reality. And if that's true, then the one thing we get to, con to control is how we react to it. So, if that's true, let's stop being afraid of the pain and the work and the struggle. Let's embrace the real work that it takes human caterpillars to become butterflies. I mean, what are we trying to hide from ourselves and our children? The truth? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we all relate to the struggle to just let go of that terrible, terrible story that you have to be perfect just to be good enough? Let's teach our young that the struggles that they are going to end up encountering they are in no way, shape, or form a sign of failure, but instead they are the path to success. I think we can use hearing that ourselves sometimes. Let's drop this notion that greatness is saved for a few lucky people with the reality that the vast majority of us can achieve great things if we just keep working at it. Because you know what? Everybody deserves to be proud of who they've become. And everybody deserves to be supported through all the work that it takes them to get there. I know that I was and that's why I'm standing in front of you right now. I know you all want to be and that's why you made it here today. And I know that's the story that I'm going to teach my kids. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you.